Hey guys, and welcome to Taylor Tech. So in my last video, we talked about doing real 10 gigabit networking at home using old enterprise gear. And we ran into a few small issues that uh, would be problems for a lot of people in their homes. The primary one was the noise. These guys are loud, like uncomfortably loud. You don't want to have it in the same room as you. So the question in today's video is, is it possible to make this guy silenter? This video brought to you by Noctua, makers of quality fans packed with high performance features and a distinctive styling to set your next project apart. Okay, so while in today's video we're going to be working specifically on this UCS 6120XP, my hope is that uh, I can convey a general process for how you would do this type of mod to any sort of gear that you have that needs to be silenter, whether it's a 1U switch like this or a server or um, some other type of device that you've got in your home environment. Um, because ultimately the fundamentals of how you do this are the same regardless of what type of equipment you're on. So the first step in any project like this is determine what the feasibility of doing the project is, gonna, is like. You need to figure out where the fans are in the device, how they're connected, what kind of power usage they have, what size they are, and then see if it's possible to actually replace them without damaging or you know, significantly uh, altering the device. Sometimes it's worth it to do a significant alteration, in a lot of cases it's not. So, fortunately, let's do this one. all the fans in this device are in these two fan modules. Um, and as you can see here, they, they look like they're standard 40 millimeter fans. So what we're gonna do is actually measure them and make sure that's what they are. So let's bust out the caliper and measure how wide, how long, etc. So these guys are, So it's saying 39 and a half millimeters wide, which is essentially 40 millimeters. And if it's like anything else on the market, yep, 39.7, so that's 40 millimeters deep. So 40 by 40, which is a standard fan size. And then length is pretty significant. So it's 55.7 or 56 millimeters, which is essentially two 28 millimeter fans together, which is a standard size. So essentially we have either one 40 by 56 millimeter fan, which is huge, or two uh, 40 by 28 millimeter fans stacked together. So we know what size there are, and we know that there are six fans or three fans per module. So we know that these are standard uh, 40 by 40 by 28 or 56, depending on how you want to look at it, fans, uh, which is a very common size, very easy to find something that will fit uh, in this space that we can replace it with. The next big question is, how are these powered? So to do that, we're going to have to open this fan module up because all we can see from the back is the PCB where it connects into the, uh, the main board of the switch. And uh, no fan I know of comes with PCB sticking out the end. So let's take this top cover off of this fan module and see what we see inside. All right, and we're loose. All right, so we can see on the inside We've got four plugs here, although three are the same, one's different. I'm gonna guess this one on the end goes to the LED in the front, and then we've that leaves us with four different plugs. Each one has eight wires coming out of it, going to a single fan pair, which strongly suggests that these are gonna be standard four-pin PWM fans, and there's just two of them stuck together. How do we actually verify this, that these are you know standard four-pin PWM fans? Well, we know or can easily look up what the pinout for a PWM fan is. Generally speaking, you've got a ground, a 12 volt uh, power supply, and up to five volt speed control. Editing Taylor here. Um, so yeah, I actually got that backwards. Uh, the five volt is the signal from the fan to the machine, letting it know the speed of the fan, and the less than one volt is the actual control signal. That cost me uh, a couple hours later on in troubleshooting and then finally redoing those connections so that they were swapped back into the correct order. Um, don't be like me, double check your wiring before you put things back together. Also do be like me and do non-destructive modding so that when you make a mistake like this, it's easy to revert. And then a final, usually less than one volt digital signal uh, line. So what we wanna do is we wanna test the voltage on each of these to see uh, how but see what kind of setup we have going on in here. 
To do that, we actually need to take the cover off of this guy and leave this cover off of the fan module. What you'll do is, once you get the cover off, stick the fan module back in with its cover off and put power to the switch. Get out your, volt, your, uh, <clears throat> get out your multimeter, set it to voltage, and uh, put the ground somewhere along the case. Any hole on the side of the case will do because the entire case is a ground. And then use your red probe and test each of these leads at the back of the fan module. Um, look at what the voltage is on each of the eight. Don't make assumptions because we don't know exactly what Cisco might have done in this case. Generally, most manufacturers are going to use standardized items like PWM fans um, or other fans of that nature. They're not going to come up with something totally proprietary, but you never know. So as we go through and test these voltages, we find that they actually are standard, two sets of standard PWM fans. You've got a 12 volt, a less than one volt, a five volt, a ground, and then the pattern repeats. Um, now the coloration on the wires is very different than most PWM fans, but it is something we can match up. With that knowledge, it, this becomes a much simpler operation to replace these guys with PWM fans. We can just get 12 off-the-shelf consumer PWM fans and replace them. So the next thing, once we've determined that, these are, the, these, these are replaceable fans and that we can get standard off-the-shelf fans to replace them with and not have to do something cra too crazy is figuring out how much airflow we need. Um, there's a lot of things you can do. One, you can try and match the airflow that these fans uh, produce. So none of the markings are visible until you take it further apart, but these particular fans are 25 CFM fans and there are six of them um, because these are actually single fan modules, giving this switch a total airflow of 150 CFM from the fans. Unfortunately, when we look at all the options out there, trying to replace 150 CFM with another 150 CFM, there's no way to get that much airflow in this small of a space without making a whole lot of noise. Um, so what we want to do is we want to look at how much airflow is actually needed for a device of this size with this kind of wattage going through it. Um, there are a couple places you can look online and there are formulas for uh, you know internal temperature versus external temperature and then uh, you can get your, with that differential, you can get the amount of air that you need to pass over the device to get it cooled or pass through the device to get it cooled. Um, but that gets pretty complicated. You probably won't know what the internal temperature is going to be uh, in your device to know how to cool it. So uh, there are some general formulas you can use. One of the ones I came across from Dell uh, stated that for a rack mountable device, you need 0 0.09 CFM of airflow per watt that the device is drawing. Uh, now this particular switch is drawing uh, just under 300 watts at idle, um, but the spec sheet states that it can drop to 550 watts. What that means is that we need somewhere between just under 30 CFM of airflow and 49.5 CFM of airflow from the fans to be able to adequately cool this switch. Now we absolutely have to be over that minimum for it to be safe to keep the device functioning, um, but if we can't get up to that maximum, what that's going to mean is that we are going to have a hard cap on how much power we can draw with the device before we risk running out of uh, headroom with the fans. Now you may say to yourself, well, why did they have three times the airflow that they really needed to cool the device? Well, uh, there's basically two options. One is that they may have significantly over-provisioned the air in it to uh, allow for redundancy. If one of the fan modules is completely dead, they still want it to be able to cool itself. So it still has 75 CFM of air, which is uh, plenty to cool it um, based on its wattage. And uh, the other option is that it actually gets a lot hotter than most rack mount devices, which is a, a significant possibility. Um, and it needs more airflow to adequately cool itself. As far as I can tell, there's nothing significantly hot going on inside. I, you know, when I was testing the voltage uh, on the fan headers here, I, you know, did a quick check to see what's getting warm because I had it on for about five minutes with the cover off. And really the only thing that was getting warm on this particular switch were some VRM modules, at least they looked like VRM modules, that were uh, vertical pieces of PCB next to each of the ASICs inside. Uh, and those are the only things that really seem to be getting warm, uh, even with the switch on for five minutes straight and no traffic on it, uh, none of the other ASICs or anything were getting warm at all. That was, Those are kind of the things that I'll be keeping an eye on is, then they're mostly, they're right here at the back where all the ASICs are, right before the modules. Is keeping an eye on the back of this switch, is it getting physically warm after it's been on for 30 minutes or an hour? If I can start to feel some heat there, that's probably a bad sign and we may need to 
revert this back to the original fans. So since we're going to have 12 total fans in here, um, and we need to provide at least 30 CFM of airflow, that means that each fan has to provide at least 2.5 CFM of airflow, or 2.6 CFM, to adequately cool this switch uh, at its minimum idle settings. Ideally, we probably want somewhere closer to four or five CFM to be able to put a nominal load on it, not a heavy load. Uh, if we wanted to put a full load on it, you're gonna need somewhere closer to eight or nine CFM to really get enough air pushing through the device to keep it cool under a full load. So how do we find the ideal fan? Well, we know it needs to be a 40 by 40 by 28 or thinner fan. Um, we also know that it needs to be a 12 volt PWM fan. Ideally, we want the sound level of the fan to be much lower than these, which each of these fans is 66 decibels, which is why this guy is so freaking loud. Um, ideally, it needs to be less than 30 decibels. Uh, even quieter would be better. Um, and it needs to have at least 4 CFM of airflow. We shouldn't have a problem there. Most fans push more than that. Um, ideally, we'd be up around 7 or 8 CFM of airflow. Um, there's a relatively new product out from Noctua, which is the in a four by 20 fan, which is a PWM 40 millimeter fan. Um, this is the fan that I went with for this project uh, because one, it does push five and a half CFM of airflow, which is enough to adequately cool the switch based on the math that we did earlier. Um, also, it is uh, a, has a 14.9 decibel uh, sound level, which is exceedingly quiet. So to give you an idea of how incredibly silent 14 and a half, 14.9 decibels is, uh, the sound of your own heartbeat is about 10 decibels, and the sound of, uh, of a quiet breeze outside, just a real light breeze, is about 20 decibels. So this is going to be so quiet that in most circumstances, you wouldn't even know the fan is running. Now, I've got a sound meter that I tested these fans with, and it was so quiet in the room that I couldn't actually distinguish between the fan being on and the fan being off. Uh, you know, the background level of the room was between 15 and 20 decibels, and so the fan itself was almost no sound at all. Um, I actually have to get my ear about two, three inches away from the fan before I can even hear if it's on or not. So these things are incredibly freaking silent. So one other reason that these Noctua fans are really nice when you're doing a project like this is what they come with. Now, most fans that you're going to buy, it's going to come with just the fan. Noctua sends you a lot more than just the fan, and we'll talk about, and specifically for projects like this, that's great because um, with systems like this where you have these proprietary plugs, you're going to have to either directly wire the fans into those plugs, which you know basically ruins the fan for any other purpose because you have to cut the leads on it, or you're going to have to splice these plugs onto new plugs that a PWM fan can plug into. And in addition to giving you the fan and some mounting hardware, they also give you a lot of adapters. They give you a low noise adapter, which reduces the speed of the fan, which we won't use. They give you an extension cable and a Y cable. And these cables have lots of plugs on them, which means that if you need to have extra plugs, you don't have to go buy them separately. You can just use the ones that came with the fan kit. And uh, you know that way it doesn't cost you additional on top of the fans. That's not to say the fans themselves aren't a little bit pricey. They're certainly not cheap. They're great because they're very, very high quality fans. But um, I feel like the addition of all those little extras actually adds a lot of value for modders, particularly because you've got extenders if you need to go further, you've got additional plugs if you need to splice a plug in to get the fan to actually connect. So in addition to the specs of the fan, which are excellent, all of these little extras are what really set the Noctua fans apart for me and made them a much better value than trying to buy a fan that was maybe four or five dollars cheaper a piece, but then having to buy a bunch of additional plugs and wires and extensions on top of that so that I could wire them in. So now that we've determined the feasibility of this project and what fans we're going to use, it's time to start the actual mod. You need quite a few tools for this mod, so let's go through the quick list of what you're going to need. You're going to need screwdrivers for disassembling and reassembling things. You're going to need wire cutters, wire strippers, uh, usually the same tool. Um, you're going to need a soldering iron and solder. Uh, I'd recommend that you use actual electrical solder with its rosin cord and not uh, plumbing solder that's flux cord because flux is acidic and can actually damage electronics. Uh, you're also going to need some heat shrink tubing to uh, tidy things up once you've soldered the wires together and keep them from shorting out on each other. Uh, some zip ties to do a little cable management at the end and um, a lot of time because this is a bit of a time intensive mod. So to give you an idea of what we're going for, we've got our fan module that we took the cover off of previously. And here's the fan module that I've already modded. So you can see we've got the six fans together there and some interesting cabling 
to make it all fit because the constraints of the one U form factor are pretty dang strong and it makes it very difficult to route wires unless you have space specifically designed for routing wires. But we'll go over that here in a bit. So the first thing to do is get the old fans out. So a few things to keep in mind as we're doing this uh, is that these fan modules like this, and if you're doing it on something similar that has similar fan modules on it, they're not really meant to be serviced. They're meant to be replaced. That means that a lot of times things like the screws used and the, the actual metal that they're made out of are not of the highest quality. Um, I found that the metal on these Cisco fan modules and the screws themselves are exceedingly soft. They're easy to strip out. They're easy to bend. So kind of keep that in mind as you're doing this. Use a gentle hand when you can so that you don't inadvertently bend something that you don't want to bend. So we've got all the screws out and that guy is loose. We want to go ahead and unplug the fan modules and we want to cut the zip ties that are holding them down to these tie downs in the middle of the fan module. Now <clears throat> to prevent yourself from accidentally cutting wires you don't mean to, what I'd recommend is you turn it over and then you can see the bottom of the zip tie and you cut the zip tie from the bottom and then pull it through. That is, in my opinion, much safer and much less likely to damage the wires than using wire clippers, especially when you're talking about wires that are like 20, 22, 23 gauge, where you won't even know if you cut them, they're so thin. The ties are out, and we can pull out the fan module. The fans out of the fan module, there we go. Be careful as you're taking these off and putting them on the other fans. These are exceedingly soft metal. You can see how wobbly that is. They've got some very thin parts. Um, it's very easy to make a boo-boo and make something fall apart. With these exceedingly deep fans, it's, it's easy to lose stuff inside of them. Just lost a screw inside of one. All right. And that bracket's free. Now we'll take the bracket off the back. Two, one more. Again, now at this point, this bracket is very flimsy. Be very careful with it. Okay. Next, we need to cut the leads off of the old fans. So when you're cutting them, make sure you leave yourself a good two or so inches of wire. You don't want all of it. You don't want to cut it way back here because you're going to have way too much wire to try and cram back into that small space behind the fans inside the fan module. But you do want enough that if you make a mistake with stripping them, you can strip them a second time without running out of space, without of wire. So leave yourself, like I said, inch and a half, two inches, should be plenty. And now you can discard the old fan. So a lot of this stuff has got little bits of heat shrink and whatnot on it that you'll need to take off. If you're taking off the heat shrink, I highly recommend you just kind of score the outside of it. Don't cut all the way through it because you don't want to cut the wires underneath and then peel at it and it will actually peel apart where you scored it and you can take it off and then get to your wires. Okay, so now that we've cut the leads um, on off the fans, it is time to get our female fan, PWM fan lead. And this is where these additional accessories and with the Noctua fans come in really handy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut off the end of one of these Y splitters so that I can use this female lead in my mod. Again, I'm gonna leave myself about an inch to two inches of wire. More is always better than less uh, until you're running out of space. I don't need that anymore. And then we're gonna remove all of this extra shielding and sleeving so that we can actually get to the wires. Just like with the little bit of heat shrink that was on this guy, I'm gonna very carefully use the knife to score the outside of the heat shrink. We're not cutting through it, we're just scoring it so that we don't accidentally slice a wire. And then once it's scored, it should be relatively easy to rip apart. Okay. And we're ready to actually start stripping wires. So at this point for the rest of this mod, I'm gonna move this uh, camera in a little bit so you can see a little bit better because it's gonna be really difficult to you, for you to see some of the smaller things that I'm doing with the camera so far back. So let's move the camera in. Okay, we're all set. So the first thing we're gonna to need to do now that we've got these guys cut is to strip them. It's very simple. We're gonna just do some quick strips. So we've got those stripped and kind of twisted the ends of the wire of the the uh, wires together so that 
they don't go all cattywampus and they're easier to splice. All right. Now you want to be careful. You can see I've cut a few of the strands. Got a little too sharp of an angle on there. I think there's only two strands left. That's not really enough to get a good signal. And the yellow on this one is the signal cable. So we're just going to go a little bit deeper. This is why we left ourselves so much extra. You can see there's so many more wires when I went a little deeper. Fold that over, twist it all together, make one wad of cable out of it. Now I probably would have been, I might have been okay, um, especially with the low wattage that these PETA, these Noctua fans are, um, to have just gone with a thinner wire. But just to be safe, we're going to cut that a little bit shorter. That's why we left ourselves a little bit extra. So that one wire is going to be a little shorter than the rest of these. All right. And let's be a slob and just put it on the floor. Okay, so let's get one of those pre-stripped headers over here. Next, we're going to start splicing this stuff together. Before we do that, we want to put heat shrink on because the last thing you want to do is wire all these together, put the soldering iron to them, and then realize, ooh, I didn't put heat shrink over the wire first. You don't need a huge long section like this. I don't, I'm not going to shrink the whole, the cover the entire thing with heat shrink. I'm just going to cover the soldered and spliced section, which is going to save me a little bit of bulk in the long run. So I'm going to make a big stack of little sleeves. So we're going to start threading these over each wire. And once you get this part done, you can actually start twisting things together and soldering. So now that we've got all of our heat shrink over the one side, it's time to start actually splicing these together. So, so we need to be very careful as we're splicing these together to make sure that we put the right wire to the right wire. So for the first pair, it is red to yellow, and then blue to blue, and then yellow to green and black to black. So we're going to repeat that again. Now remember the order is the same. 12 volt, which is yellow, to orange. It's always a good idea to write down stuff as you're figuring it out so you can come back to it later. The first time I did this I had to refer to notes for every single wire just to make sure I was doing it right. By the time you're on your sixth module, you just know it off the top of your head. Now the next one is our digital, which is green, and that goes to blue on the PDVM header. Next is going to be signal, which is white, and that is going to go to green on the PWM header. So many wires, they get in the way of each other. Finally is ground, which is black, and that goes to gray. All right, so that monstrosity is all at least twisted together. Next, we're going to actually solder each of these wires. So the reason for soldering them is so that one, they don't get pulled apart, and two, it forms a better electrical connection than just twisting the wires together. Hold the wire down on the soldering iron tip and place the solder on there. Should not take long for the wire to heat up. Just give it a second. You'll feel the heat coming up the wire. Once you can feel the heat, the tip should be plenty hot to accept the solder. Now we're soldering kind of from the back of the wire. We're not putting the solder right on the soldering iron tip. It will, of course, instantly melt on the soldering iron tip, but we want it to flow into the wire and not just across the tip of the soldering iron. There we go. First one done. Eight to go. So you don't need a huge amount of solder on these, just enough to get it to the point where it's permanently joined once that's done. You can straighten it out, fold the soldered joint over, and then just slip the heat shrink over. Do that eight times, and you're ready to do the heat shrink. There you have it. Make sure that those are roughly centered over the solder and the joint. You can kind of feel the solder ball in there. Let me scoot that way a little bit. Each one may be slightly different depending on where it was, and you're ready to heat shrink it. So let's get these out of the way. So I don't want to accidentally heat shrink them before I do the next one. All right. Okay, so the next thing you'll need is a heat gun. Now this is not a hair dryer. A hair dryer will not work. It's an actual heat gun. It lists the temperatures on the back that it goes to. I generally, for this type of thing, set it on high between the second and third highest setting. So I'm gonna turn it on. 
and let it warm up. It only takes a, a minute or two to warm up. And then we're gonna heat shrink this stuff down while it's hot. You see very quickly, the heat shrink starts to get smaller and just sucks down on top of that solder ball, closing off all the open wire so that it won't short out. All right. And there you have it. Uh, actually relatively professional looking harness for attaching a PWM fan to these Cisco fan modules. Again, this same type of process should work for any kind of harness that you end up with. Um, if it may be an eight pin like this, it may be a four pin that's square instead of in a row. Um, any type of harness, you should be able to make the same thing again. Okay, so now we have all three of our harnesses made and they look nice and uh, relatively professional. So the next step is going to be to take the Noctua fans out and get them ready. Now, unfortunately, despite the beautiful sleeving that's on it, we have to take that off for this mod. It's because the uh, way that we're gonna route these wires, we actually have to be able to route them through the screw holes on the fan and body itself. Um, to get the sleeving off of here, um, we're gonna do the same thing uh, like we did on the wire end and on the harness. We're gonna score the outside of the heat shrink, being careful not to cut all the way through very gently there we go and then just peel it off Let's do this on the other end the first time you do it it takes a while the twelfth time it goes pretty fast all right next we have to get this uh, loose sleeve off here A little bit more. Pull that guy off. All right, so now we've stripped the wire, or stripped the uh, sleeving off. And finally, we have to get this guy off. So these plugs are not normally meant to be removable, but you can remove them if you need to. Um, there's a little clip, I'm gonna see if I can get some light on it, right there, that you can press back and then Carefully press it and pull. You don't want to push too hard. You don't want to bend it out of shape because we're going to put it back in there after we run the wires. But for now, we need to remove it because that big blocky piece of plastic is not fitting through these screw holes. Okay, now your fans are prepped. Just do that 12 times. Your fans are prepped, you're ready to go. Okay, so now it's time to reassemble uh, the brackets into the fan, mo uh, the fan module body. Um, and get everything together. So you'll see the fans have little arrows on them telling you the orientation. So we've got the air flows through this direction and the blade rotates that way. Unfortunately, they all go the same direction. I don't have any counter rotating fans because ideally I'd want them rotating opposite but then they'd be blowing at each other. That'd be kind of pointless. So what we're gonna do, we'll assemble the front bracket first. Now let's start screwing the fans onto the bracket. Okay, front bracket's done. Let's do the back bracket. So we said this was the orientation, right? Oh, we want this to go this way, right? Yeah. I'll figure it out here one of these days. There we go, that's what we want. Match the orientation. Excellent. Now we're ready to put the fans back into the bracket, to the, I don't know what to call this, into the body. Let's put the fans back into the body of the fan module. So, simply let's start with the front fans. And screw it in.
Okay. Now we learn why we've made a freaking spaghetti nest of wires. Note how all the wires are coming out of the top. The same for every single fan. Well, remember, this, when it goes in the switch, is sitting exactly flush with the top of the fans. And this cover is going to be right here. So how am I going to get all of these wires down to that PCB? There's not very many options for it. The best solution that I came up with was to actually thread them through these top fan hole uh, screw holes, which are unused, and then reassemble the plug on the other side. One thing that I did to help with cable management and not have so much spaghetti is actually braided these. Um, if you don't have a daughter or a girlfriend that likes you to braid her hair, or wife, whatever, you know. Braiding is really simple. You use threes, so you're gonna have to pair green and blue together, but make threes, yellow over, black over, paired over, yellow over, black over, paired over, and just repeat until you have a braid. That's, I could maybe get one more, but I'm not gonna force it. All right, so remember our PWM order is from the left to the right, black, yellow, green, blue. If you're at all confused about that, you can always look at these and see what order they go in. Test them, make sure that they're actually locking in. If you overdid it, like I just did on this one, getting them out, you can use a very sharp knife, if I can find my very sharp knife, and ever so gently pry that guy back out, just like that. Be very careful when doing that. Do not cut yourself. Ta-da! We've reassembled that. So it goes that way. Ah, I could have gotten another braid out of it, but that's okay. All right. So for the front fans, similar thing. We'll start with the same pass-through right where they came into the fan body. And then go further through the opposite side of the other fan. All right, and then just like the front fans, we're gonna braid this so that we can cable manage it easier. Okay, so we have everything braided now, and all of the plugs are on. Tested everything, everything is nice and firm in there. All that's left is the final, final, final assembly um, and wire management, because wire management is huge in 1U devices. So let's start by plugging and our harnesses one at a time. So plug in a harness, plug in the fans associated with it. You don't have to do it this way, but to keep things straight for myself, I chose to plug the back fan into the first set of leads and the front fan into the second set of leads. That was just for my own personal keeping it straight. Find a nice place to snug these down out of the way. Now, what I did Remember, we have our cable management straps, spots, whatever, however you want to label them in the center there. So we're going to try and take advantage of those. We'll kind of double it over there. So once you kind of got a not horrific set of cables, take a zip tie, pass it through that slot, bring it over your knotted mass of cables. Once you get the zip tie started, just double check everything, make sure it's plugged in, make sure you're taking up as much of the slack as possible so that you don't have excess cable slopping around causing a problem. And then cinch it down. It really is amazing when you do that final cinch, just how much that sucks the rest of the cable out of the way. There we go. There's the final result. We're blocking as little of the airflow as possible, getting these wires down as much as possible, these plugs out of the way on the sides and on the bottom, so that when that is on, we still have a path for air to get out without including too much of the exit. All right, all that's left, put the top on, stick it in, make sure it works now one thing you may want to do if you st still have the cover off your switch at this point 
is to plug this in like this and just visually inspect each fan and make sure they're all working. These screws, important point, if you've lost any of these so far, these are M3 flat top 0.5 millimeter pitch by 6 millimeter long screws. You can get them at Ace Hardware. You cannot get them at Home Depot. The smallest screw Home Depot sells is an M4. These are smaller. So M3 half millimeter pitch, three or six millimeters long. Um, I would use blue Loctite if you're replacing the screws so that they don't accidentally loosen themselves out. And you're all set. Only thing left to do is plug it in and turn it on. Whew, all right guys, that was a hell of a mod, but it is done. The only thing that's left to do is to test that sound, wattage, and airflow and see how well it works now that we've got it all modded. Okay guys, so while I was doing the uh, B-roll shoots to capture the after mod airflow and wattage and uh, noise level, um, I ran into uh, an unfortunate circumstance where the switch was turning itself off after a medium amount of time. So I was really surprised because I was feeling, you know, the VRMs that generally get really hot are all right here along the A6 in the back. And uh, it wasn't warm here. I mean, I was getting good warm air out the back and decent airflow. Um, not great, but decent. And so I was surprised it was turning itself off. Um, this caused me to plug the switch back into the console uh, and see exactly what was going on, why was it shutting itself off, and what I got was the error messages that I'm putting up on the screen now, uh, stating that the fans, while they were operating at their rated speed, um, they were not within the range that the switch expected. So the switch was turning itself off because it was assuming the fan to be dead because the fan was not at the speed that it wanted. Uh, and that is un really unfortunate because... Uh, that just means that doing a straight fan swap on this particular switch is not going to work. Um, you know, there are things you can do to um, emulate PWM signals and, uh, you know, trick a device into thinking a fan is rotating at a certain speed. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have those things with me. There are different, there are timers that you can use. You could use an Adreno to kind of give you some two-way communication between the fan and the system. Um, there's different risk levels. If you just throw a timer in there that emulates the proper rotation speed, um, you'll never know if the fan actually dies. The Adreno is a little bit more complicated to set up because you actually have to code the software that you're gonna to use to read the fan speed uh, and actually report a speed back to the, to the system on the switch. So unfortunately, I don't, I'm not gonna be able to go forward with this mod. I'm really kind of disappointed because the numbers were great. Uh, we saw a significant reduction in noise level, a little over 20 decibel reduction. Uh, and that was actually with the power supply fans, which I didn't replace, um, spinning up at a really high speed. You know, So that said, the Noctua fans performed excellently. I was really happy with the way I was able to cable manage it. Um, you know, These fans, I feel like, are probably some of the best fans I've ever used in a PC for the purpose of modding something. Um, you know, especially when you look at something like a one U form factor, you need a lot of flexibility in how you mount things, how you wire things. Uh, and I, you know, I was given everything I needed by these fans. Um, the fact that they actually sleeved the cables uh, with a loose sleeve that you could easily remove and that the cables were individually stranded and not heat welded together like you see on some fans made it really easy to route them through the, the mounting holes on the fan to get them in that nice flat uh, form factor that you have to have in a one U case. Um, and the, uh, yeah, overall is very pleased, you know, between that and the, all the accessories they come with, they're pretty much ideal if you're going to be modding any equipment. Um, <clears throat> but unfortunately not all equipment is going to like having its fans replaced. And while you will see, uh, those hard coded fan speeds on, uh, a lot of proprietary gear like this Cisco switch and, uh, other similar rack mount devices, Usually, sometimes you'll, you'll have a little more flexibility with things like servers, which will uh, often gauge their, uh, you know, gauge off of temperature and not off of fan speed. Um, they may report warnings that fans are, are not working at the expected level, but generally speaking, they won't just turn themselves off um, unless they're overheating. That said, every device is different, and you probably want to do some research before 
you uh, start a mod like this. I did as much research as I could on this device, including you know taking the cover off and digging into the guts of the device because there's not a lot of technical documentation that's available to the public. Um, you know, a lot of it is paywalled behind uh, Cisco's website. Uh, so unfortunately, I couldn't do a lot of deep dive documentation digging to see exactly what the fan specs were. You know, that said, not all is lost. Um, you know, I very well may come back in the future, get an Adreno, and try and set it up to emulate the PWM signal and get this thing up and running again. Um, and I also, uh, you know, have, in the meantime, some additional fans coming. The fans for this guy are only like 30 bucks for a pair on eBay, between 30 and 40 depending. So they're not too expensive, easy to replace. Um, so I've got another pair coming. I can use it in the meantime. I'm just going to have to figure out a way to get it as far away from me as possible because it is very loud. So one final thing I'd like to mention uh, before we wrap this up is it's really important when you're doing mods like this to do what I like to call non-destructive modding. Don't just break out the Dremel and start cutting on things. That can be fun and that can be quick and easy, but when a mod doesn't work, the last thing you want to do is leave yourself with useless gear that you've ruined trying to mod it. Um, you know, I did my best to not break things as I was going through this process. I left the entire body of the switch intact and only modded the fan modules, which I can replace. And even when I was modding the fan modules, I did my best. I didn't cut on any of the metal in there. I left all the brackets intact. I even left the Noctua fans intact other than removing their sleeving. These fans, even though they didn't work in this particular uh, instance, I can take them out and easily use them in any other project again in the future. So I just wanted to close it out on that final note of when you take on mods like this, do your best to do non-destructive modding. You'll really thank yourself in the future when you have the opportunity to reuse something out of an old modded device or a mod doesn't go as you planned and you are able to revert. All right, guys, thanks for watching. This mod didn't go exactly like we wanted, but uh, I had a good time doing it. It was really interesting to learn uh, a little bit more about uh, how this switch manages things and uh, gives me some ideas for how I can tackle it again in the future. I very well may pick myself up from an Adreno and uh, give a go at trying to give a simulated PWM signal back to the switch so that I can get it to work with these fans. Um, if you enjoyed this content, go ahead and leave a like on it. And uh, if you have any questions or comments for me, leave them in the comment section down below. If you're considering a mod like this and need some, have some questions or, or some advice, I'll do my best to help you. Um, I'll also uh, point you towards some communities that might be able to give you some better advice. If you're new to this channel, subscribe for more content like this in the future. Also, if you'd like to support me, you can do so by using the Amazon affiliate link in the description section down below. Um, if you'd like to pick up some of these Noctua fans for yourself, they will be linked in the description section. Um, I'll be linking to the 12-volt version. Uh, there's a 5-volt version, which uh, is that you will encounter in some uh, devices. Uh, there's also some other smaller, quieter versions of this fan that are a little thinner. Um, and I'll just, I'll link to all of them so that you can pick up what's going to work best for your mod. Again, thanks for watching guys. Have a good one. We'll see you on the next one.